if you were an evil record executive that wanted to create a system that could extract as much wealth from the artists, how would it look? You create somebody who is the most radical persona of counterculture as possible. And feed them hits. So there are few terms in hip hop that serve as like a truly grievous insult to any self-respecting rapper. There's biter. Yo, man, you're biting. All your homeboys are biting. Sell out. Yo, is the reason why you don't call me no more is because uh, you're a sellout or because you're just a star. Studio gangster, Stan, and many others. To call a rapper one of those terms, at least back in my day, probably still up to now, those were fighting words for the most part. However, there's a new term that is taking on a much more prominent role as an insult to alleged fake rappers and rap artists, and that term is industry plant. What is that term and why is it such a big insult, not just to rappers, but pretty much to any modern musician? In an essay on a website called Loud and Quiet, a writer named Daniel Dylan Ray describes the industry plant as such. Largely accepted to mean an artist who presents themselves as being independent and doing things on their own terms, but secretly has the industry backing and money to fund them and to artificially shape such a narrative. And I think that's a pretty good definition, but it doesn't get at why this term has become more of an insult today than say 20 years ago. For most of the existence of a music industry, Having corporate backing of some sort was kind of a requirement. Most musicians didn't have the ability to press up their own records, let alone distribute them widely. So as the music industry developed, the role of administrative industrial production company became a prominent aspect of making money as a musician. And the control of that part of the industry was worth a lot of money. But today, however, none of that matters. You don't need to press up records or CDs. You're basically uploading your brand new song to your Spotify account or TikTok, hoping it will go viral. You're no longer working with a label or a distribution company to get your CD to be released at the best time of the year, to go to Circuit City on a Tuesday to buy the album. Circuit City doesn't even exist anymore. If you're under the age of 25, you probably don't even know what I'm talking about. Instead, in 2024, you're waiting until release Friday to see what your stream data looks like. As independent music has become much more viable, the wealth and power of the music industry has diminished, and this has led to the industry making a greater effort to control what little music culture they have left under their thumb, which has allegedly led to them purposely trying to manufacture or plant corporately backed artists into the popular discourse. And these artists then make good, but relatively unoffensive, unchallenging mainstream music with the hope of reshaping the music landscape in a way that maybe gives these industry forces more power, or at least makes them some decent money that they wouldn't have made otherwise. And if true, yeah, I can see why such a thing might be seen as shameful to participate in, as an artist. If you're a plant, that means that you're willing to sell your soul for the sake of being famous, that you're not a real artist, that you're allowing yourself to be used by the industry instead of charting your own path, and that you weren't giving the world your best art, or worse yet, you're getting in the way of other better artists. But this is also why to me that concept doesn't make a lot of sense, because if you ask me, as long as good art is being made, I don't have a huge problem with the industry taking part in it. It's the reality of the situation. The fact is that artisan development was a huge part of the old ways of making music. And I think it's sorely missed today. I think we're probably on a lot of levels getting worse music from not every artist, but some artists than if they had a bigger team forcing them to improve their craft. Like the running joke is that Lil Baby has been making the same three songs over and over for the past five, six years. If he was forced into a real development situation, that maybe wouldn't be happening. At the same time, the existence of suspected industry plants like Chance the Rapper, Jack Harlow, Billie Eilish does raise a few eyebrows in terms of how they get so big and so popular while not necessarily 
having such groundbreaking music. This is definitely the truth for Jack Harlow. But that also doesn't mean that they have an oversized level of influence on the industry either or that great music isn't still being made today by them or other artists, just like great music was being made 20, 30 years ago. So it's hard to pinpoint exactly where the so-called industry plant really should exist, at least in 2024. This conspiracy theory doesn't fully add up once you scrutinize it a bit. To me, the whole thing is given barbershop argument. It's mostly something that people say to disparage an artist that they don't like and don't have a good reason to dislike. But that doesn't mean that this concept is completely without merit, nor that it may not have a historical significance. And that brings me to this video's main topic. What if I told you that hip hop may have had the first ever industry plant way back in the 80s, well before we knew what an industry plant was? And what if I told you that in this case, that industry plant was able to dominate all of hip hop for half a decade and be a significant influence on trends, fashion, media and music in ways that maybe they didn't deserve? that this act was on the same level as Will Smith, Rakim, Run DMC, and they created dance and fashion trends, starred in crossover media, and in many ways were more prominent and with greater celebrity status than any rapper or rap group had ever been up to that point, all while being barely recognizable on whatever thumbnail I'm using right now. This is the thumbnail like now. It may not be when you actually click on this, just keeping it real with y'all. This is a rap duo that literally shaped a ton of black culture at the time out of nowhere. Yet today, them and their music is barely relevant from one of hip hop's most relevant, memorable eras. You might ask, how could anyone from that era be so influential in the moment and then mostly forgotten as time goes on? Was it because they were propped up by the industry or was it because of something deeper, possibly more sinister? And how did all of this affect and change hip hop as we know it today for better or possibly for worse. To understand this, we have to ask what happened with Kid and Play? So it's the late 80s and this musical genre called hip hop that was born out of New York in the late 70s is starting to grow from local niche scene in New York block and house parties into a major music industry business. And the potential for huge hit tracks and major star power are starting to emerge. Early breakout acts like Curtis Blow and Grandmaster Flash released some of the biggest hits in hip hop history as early as 1980. Nucleus gives us jam on it. The Sugar Hill Gang has their second huge hit with Apache. This is hip hop's most fun era and when we don't take things too seriously, which also means this era gets overlooked and misunderstood a lot, even by yours truly. There's probably a few reasons for this, but mostly I think is because these early 80s songs, groups, and acts were still much more beholden to disco and funk sounds and aesthetics. They didn't look like hip hop yet. This is semantics I know and please old and older heads, don't come for me, I'm just giving my opinion, but consider what a lot of these acts looked like and then compare that to what Run DMC looked like back in 1984-85. When you look at Grandmaster Flash and the Sugar Hill Gang, you still see the flamboyant cartoonish imagery and the aesthetics of the disco influence that birthed them. Many of their songs include live bands and the songs themselves could be seven or eight minutes long because they included break beats because hip hop originated as dance music and party music. But Run DMC, while still being somewhat connected to this aesthetic, introduced something different, something cooler and edgier, more bravado, more macho, more brand content conscious and more explicitly black. At the disco, everyone was invited, black folks, white folks, rich, poor, straight, queer. It was an alternative youth movement, but hip hop, which owes as much to the urban centers of New York as it does to disco nightclubs, was becoming much more black and brown and very male centered, intense and aggressive. And Run DMC embodied all of this, even as they crossed over to white audiences, which is another incredibly important feature to the awakening of hip hop as a national and eventually a global music force. Run DMC found ways to penetrate white audiences using more rock oriented sounds in a lot of the records that they made, including making songs with at the time rock juggernaut Aerosmith. It was the first example of the crossover potential of hip hop to draw in white youth audiences the same way that jazz and rock and roll did previous generations. 
But as a new twist of the formula, Run DMC also became the first hip hop act to be brand conscious. The cool jumpsuits, the fat gold chains, and probably most significantly, the shell toe Adidas, all were as important a part of the music as anything else and paved the way for rappers to be celebrities and influencers as we might think of them today. Their song, My Adidas, allegedly got them a million dollar endorsement deal in the 80s, which meant it was basically like a billion dollars. And this surely put all of the corporate powers on notice that hip hop was a potential gold mine for the culture industry. The term the culture industry isn't just something I made up. It refers to the work of German philosophers Theodore Adorno and Max Horkheimer. And I won't bog you down with a ton of philosophy, but they theorized nearly 75, 100 years ago that capitalism would eventually be the driving force behind art and music, that our movies, music, dramas, pretty much everything that becomes expression of culture would eventually be negatively affected by capitalism because the industry that funds these cultural artifacts will put monetary gain ahead of artistic expression. And they have been pretty much proven right, especially as we look at popular movies and music right now. We have the superhero genre and the huge tentpole blockbuster films that have become basically the only type of movies that make money in theaters at this point. And worse yet, popular music, even as we've taken the industry out of the equation, has now just become a slave to trending sounds on TikTok in short two minutes songs on streaming services where your favorite rapper will release a bloated 15 track album where only seven of the songs are good. And then two months later, release the extended version with 10 more mediocre songs that are all like one minute and 59 seconds long to 250 if you're lucky. And the only point to that is to get as many streams as possible because that's how they make money. So the art of it all has been pretty much murdered for a lot of these mainstream figures. And sure, every once in a while, you even get your favorite alternative rapper or R&B artist that does at least break some of the rules. But because they're controlled within the same system, their art is still stifled. In his video, The Culture Industry and the Death of Hip Hop, video essay is one dime breaks it down perfectly. The culture industry is a conglomeration of culture producing factories, which generate cultural commodities for mass consumption. The term commodity here is key. Popular music is an instance of what Adorno calls cultural commodities, not simply because they are made by the culture industries like big record labels or film studios, but because they are manufactured, like all commodities, solely to realize their exchange value on the capitalist market. Songs produced in the culture industry are made to make money to capture the attention of a mass audience and sell as many records as possible. Now, I'm not blaming Run DMC for this. They were just two kids from New York wanting to be a part of this amazing new thing called hip hop. Little did they know that their success would be imitated across the culture so other folks can get their piece of the pie. But keep this in mind as we talk about what's happening around hip hop at this time and what happens going into the future. With Run DMC emerging, the aesthetic of early old school hip hop seemed to change overnight. And you saw the emergence of future legends like Eric B and Rakim, Big Daddy Kane, The Beastie Boys, Salt and Pepper, LL Cool J, Boogie Down Productions, MC Light, EPMD, and Kid and Play. From old heads watching who are maybe like questioning me, name four Kid and Play songs. Would you put Kid and Play over any of those acts I named just now from that exact same era? For my young hip hop fans, do you even know who these two cats are? You may recognize them just because their look was so iconic, but I doubt it. Even me as a pretty hardcore hip hop head who was there in the moment targeted by the music, I can only name two Kid and Play songs. But again, at the time, they were just as successful as any of those rappers I just named. In fact, they were more successful than them, at least for a period of time. I like the sprite in you. Hey, yo, kid, where's the party? Check it out, I'm kid, and I kid you not. I like the sprite. I like the sprite a lot. My name is Sprite, but I'm not playing. I like the sprite. You know what I'm saying? I like to kick it live to a sound that's hype. So let's get into it. Kid and Play's origin story is actually really dope. It's kind of wholesome, too wholesome to be true. It sounds like something in a movie. Kid and Play are really Christopher Reed, Kid, and Christopher Martin, Play. Reed was the son of a Jamaican immigrant and an Irish woman from the Bronx, and Martin was a son of a former hoodlum turned preacher in Queens. Kid had a rough go of things as a child, living with his white Irish mother early in his childhood, who was shunned by her family for having a biracial child out of wetlock. She actually died alone apart from her family. And then after his mother died, instead of going with his grandparents, he moved in with his Jamaican grandfather. 
And the, the story behind that is pretty damn ugly. Kid describes it as a culture shock going from living under this Irish woman into this all black neighborhood with a Jamaican dad. However, his father provided a solid foundation for him and Kid was smart and nerdy, which had him on a good track before hip hop fame came calling. On the flip side, Play was your classic street urchin who was essentially saved by hip hop. When he wasn't getting kicked out of four different high schools, he was a stick up kid and was not headed in the right direction. And them meeting as a rival rap and dance crew probably saved his life when he was in high school. Kid was a member of a group called the Turnout Brothers and Play was a member of the Super Love. Along with their future DJ, producer and manager and a very important figure in this story, Herbie the Love Bug. Out of pod. <laughs> and Salt and Pepper came after you guys. Yeah, Herbie. If, well, Herbie was the third guy who came in, and then Salt and Pepper. Herbie. Yeah, Herbie. Herbie, Herbie, Herbie love Bug, which is our producer mm -hmm. manager. After high school, Kid and Play broke off and made their own duo and tried their hands at making music to make their dreams come true. And it seems like once they became their own group, they created a very unique and deep bond. Play helped Kid develop a more savvy, charismatic persona and helped him engage with his environment and blackness as a whole. And the dudes, and all of a sudden you hear this, uh, this voice, you know what I'm saying? This, this, this voice like you wouldn't believe is like, yo, it's the rapper. It, it, this is the guy. Let's check out. Let's, let's get up close to the booth and, and see. And lo and behold, we make our way and we're fighting and we're getting through. And, and there's a guy with, with, a, with an afro with glasses this thick and freckles on his face. And on the flip side, Kid convinced Play to get out of the streets and get his GED and slow down so that they could actually pursue the music that they were looking into without him possibly facing jail time or death. This dichotomy of Kid as the straight laced and earnest one and Play as the slick hustler type didn't always play out in their music, but it was a core theme in pretty much all of their films. Also didn't hurt that Kid was biracial and extremely light skinned to the point of nearly passing, which played into this dichotomy. Throughout their career, Kid is the main focus of most of their media, especially away from the music, which also was helped by his one of a kind at the time hair, a thick poofy high top fade that was said to be 10 to 12 inches at times. In these early days, however, Kid and Play were still trying to figure out how to get attention outside of that. So they released their first two songs as the Fresh Force Crew, Force, Fresh Crush, I don't know, it, it, it's one of them, it's very 80s. Not to be mistaken for the R&B band and writing collective Full Force, who you might remember from their first two movies, House Party 1 and 2, as comedic bullies. Yo, this punk motherfucker throwing shit at us, Yo, man. Good, man. But Full Force is also like responsible for some of the best pop hit records of the 90s up until the 2010s. Like seriously, when you look at the resume of the songs that these three dudes wrote for everyone from Patti LaBelle to James Brown to Britney Spears to NSYNC. So if I were less disciplined, there will be way more tangents like that. Like this story is so cool. It's like... The six degrees of separation between Kid and Play and so many significant figures of that time up until now would add a whole extra hour to this video if I didn't force myself to try to keep it to a minimum. But keep factoids like that in mind because it's going to happen over and over and over again. So as the Fresh Force crew, Kid and Play released two songs, She's a Skeezer and Rock Me, which were complete ripoffs of Run DMC songs like they probably should have gotten That's sued. Play and I's first group. Yeah. See, now, the, uh, both our individual groups kind of disintegrated. You know, everybody could start doing their own thing and mm -hmm. or getting discouraged and whatever. And me and Play, even though we were in different groups, we would hang out all the time. Um, and so we were just like, well, you know, me and you should do something. We hang out every freaking day. Um, let's do something. And that, that was our first, that was the first iteration of Kid and Play. We called ourselves uh, Fresh Force. Okay, now and we were very, very whack. <laughs> She's a skeezer, cause every time I rock, always waiting backstage to clock my top. My girlfriend may score me, my friends try to warn me. As we all know, hip hop has never rewarded people being unoriginal, so these things never stood a chance. And they went back to the drawing board and enlisted the aforementioned Herbie Love who was already starting to make waves as a writer and producer, doing it for Salt and Pepper. I keep getting saying Salt and Pepper. It's Salt and Pepper. I don't know why I'm doing Pepper. I'm just old, but I, that's not even an excuse. I'm, I'm just dumb. Herbie is a major part of their story early on, and the strongest evidence that, surprise, early on, Kid and Play weren't really industry plants. 
It's just, it doesn't hold up. That's what I thought when I first started researching this and you'll see why as we go on. But them along with Herbie and a lot of other people, including again, Salt and Pepper, they just came up at the same time doing music and trying to be just talented young folks of this era in that particular area. Herbie was a visionary and in this nascent phase of hip hop where hip hop was still at its core dance music for parties and having fun. He was like this Tyler, the creator type figure, but without the solo career, but his creative vision congealed into what was known as the idol makers collective. And some of the biggest hits of that mid and late eighties hip hop era were made through him, not just for salt and pepper, who, by the way, he dated salt of salt and pepper. You might remember his face from a couple of those videos and not just kit and play, but also Dana Dane, Kwame, Sweet Tea and others. These are deep cuts that you won't remember if you're not like 35 at least. But if you are alive and paying attention to this early era of hip hop, you know these names and especially the fashions and the sound. Even to me, the late 80s and early 90s feels like an alien civilization, even though I lived through it and I was there when it happened. It still looks otherworldly to me. The feathered hair on the black women, the zoot suits on the black men, the baggy clothes on girls. I remember New Jack Swing and the hard 90s dancing that goes with it, as Prim's Hood Cinema often says. So many people contributed to this moment in black culture. New Edition, Teddy Riley, Michael Jackson, Prince who shall not be named. But we often forget that a lot of this starts also with Herbie Love. The looks of Salt and Pepper and Kitten Play and Kwame are instantly iconic for the time. And a lot of that came from him. This time period probably doesn't look the way it looks without him. But unlike people like Teddy Riley, who kept producing throughout the 80s and 90s, in the 2000s, and even today is making hits for a K-pop artist, Herbie cut out of rap and hip hop music early for reasons we'll get to later. And yet it was all organic. Kid and Play's involvement with Herbie, a homegrown talent, kind of kills the whole industry blunt idea. Herbie put them under salt and pepper as they started to take off. And you can see Kid and Play in early videos. Eventually they became salt and pepper's opening act as they developed more music. And then they break out on their own with big hits getting funky and probably their best song rolling with Kid and Play. During this era where hip hop had more room for variety and hadn't been so rigidly defined yet, it was still capable of being fun and lighthearted, and that made Kit and Play really perfect for the moment. They were party friendly, parent and kid friendly, and they just embodied what a big portion of people thought hip hop was supposed to be and would be going forward. In a lot of ways, it looked like an evolution of what the rock and roll, doo wop and soul era was in previous generations. And that makes sense because remember, Kid and Play and them grew up watching that in the 60s and 70s. They grew up watching The Temptations, James Brown, The Jackson 5. To a lot of people, it was a continuation of those same traditions. And Kid and Play brought that exact energy with their performances and their high energy dance and their complex and flamboyant looks. And they looked so cool and it made people want to imitate them. Like this particular dance where they jump over their own legs. I saw so many people almost break their neck trying to learn this one move. Not that I would be included in that. But I think one of the key things, aside from Kid being this unique spectacle to see, was that they were clean. Not just clean cut in their image, but also in their lyrical content. They were anti-drug, pro-safe sex, and anti-violence, etc. And this, again, is before their major mainstream success. Now, you can say that this was a cynical goal to begin with, both likely experimenting with drugs early in their careers. And as I stated, play was a former hoodlum. But it's hard to say how cynical this was, because aside from Run DMC's shoe deal, no one knew how far hip hop would go or how much money was in being commercially appealing. But wherever hip hop was going to go, Kid and Play pride themselves to be the first in line to take that trip. They were more marketable than any one of their peers. And again, this wasn't an industry thing. It was a Herbie Love thing. Herbie Love figured early on, maybe he was wrong, but figured that the hardcore aggressive hip hop that was also around at the time wasn't going to make it anywhere. Like at this time, still violence was prone to break out at hip hop shows and concerts. DJ Scott LaRock of Boogie Down Productions was possibly the first figure in hip hop to be unceremoniously murdered. It was hard for some acts to get insured to play at clubs. A lot of radio stations refused to play rap on the radio. Whatever corporate interest there was, was a little iffy, but not with Kid and Play. So much so that they caught the eye of another rising unsung legendary figure in black media, one Reginald Hutland. 
We 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 we're getting ready to do a movie soon now. Okay, we're getting ready to do a movie coming out. What's it out called? The Skinheads. Uh, no. <laughs> I don't want it to be called a skinhead. Oh, uh -huh. no. yeah, um, you know, uh, it's a movie. It's called House Parties, coming out courtesy of New Line Cinema. So we we don't want to change the look too much there, Donnie. Some of you nerds already know the name as Hutland is responsible for possibly the most beloved run of comics in the Black Panther comic series. But well before that, during this era, Hutland was proven to be a very talented black mind in media. Hutland started out making music videos, and today this has turned into a prolific career as a director and producer for shows like Modern Family and The Office, Django Unchained, etc. He even served as the president for BET for a few years. But his first big break is also the height of Kid and Play's career, the hood classic comedy House Party. House Party. Hutland had written and gotten a green light for the film, and he immediately wanted Kid and Play for the lead roles after having worked with them in earlier music videos. But the studio ironically wanted Will Smith and DJ Jazzy Jeff. However, the studio, New Line Cinema, was actually in the middle of suing Will Smith and DJ Jazzy Jeff over the Nightmare on My Street video. So Will and Jeff declined, not wanting to do business with them while they were getting sued. And Hutland got to go with his first choice, Kid and Play. It's also rumored that Kid and Play were set to be the stars for The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, with Play being Will's character and Kid being Carlton. Like, imagine this alternate universe. Who marries Jada Pinkett? Does she get to do what she really wants to do and go live on a farm instead of forcing herself to marry Will? Is Tupac alive in this universe? House Party is a classic for a lot of reasons. It's kind of like a black Ferris Bueller's day off to an extent, because it's this pocket story of just one adventurous day in the young man's life. Kid and Play are planning a big house party because Play's parents are out of town, but Kid has to sneak out of the house to go to the party because he was grounded due to a fight at school earlier that day. Not a very complex plot, but the actual execution of the movie is pretty amazing. It didn't get great reviews, but it was an immediate hit with black youth audiences, and you can see why. It's because it so genuinely got what black youth culture was at the time. And even today, it's aged far better than most media from the 80s and 90s. It's got still classic moments and sayings, AKA prehistoric memes. Ladies, B loves in the ass. Oh, dragon breath. Why don't you just go home? Little test tube, baby. So I have a theory that I've talked about in other videos that Barack Obama is like this event horizon for black media where before Barack Obama, if you wanted to make black media, you just worried about what black people wanted to see. And then after Barack Obama, suddenly you had more interest in what white people wanted to see. And although there's good media and shows both before and after Obama, you can always tell that pre Obama era black media because it doesn't seek at all to appeal to white audiences. And what this means among other things is that there's just so many like core insidery jokes and elements of humor and just things that if you're not a part of black culture from then, especially, you probably don't get it. But if you do get it, if you were there, you're probably pointing like Leonardo DiCaprio at a bunch of different stuff that happens, especially some of the people that were in the movie at the time. Like in the movie, it co-stars the legendary Robin Harris, who sadly died suddenly not long after this film. Robin Harris was looking to be the next Eddie Murphy at the time. He was only 36 years old when he died of a heart attack, unfortunately. You also have John Witherspoon, AKA Pops from the Boondocks. Tisha Campbell and Martin Lawrence are there well before they became Martin and Gina. Martin Lawrence, by the way, actually worked with Kit and Play and Herbie the Love Bug and Salt and Pep. I told myself I wasn't gonna get into all this extra shit. Tisha Campbell's friend is the mama from Baby Boy. Clifton Powell is there. And if you watch Prim Hood Cinema, you know he's everywhere. The most recognizable, unrecognizable black actor in the history of film. George Clinton is there. And then the aforementioned members of Full Force playing the bullies, which makes me wonder, like, nobody that did R&B music was as swole as these dudes. I don't understand why they look like this. They look like the recruiting class for the 1985 Miami Hurricanes. But you know, a different time, I guess. And these are just the ones I know off the bat, like not a lot of research went into that. There's probably even more people that I just don't recognize myself or didn't hear about. But at the center are Kid and Play, and they're not giving some Academy Award winning performance, but they're still carrying the movie with charisma and chemistry. Kid's inner dork comes across naturally and Play's inner slick talking hustler is just as good. And together when they have the mic or the dance floor, you understand why Hutland wanted them for the movie. Like there's this dance scene in the middle of the movie that is so iconic. And I remember seeing people try to again 
mimic it. Like this was the TikTok dance trend for the era and it still remains a crowd pleaser for them decades later. The movie's beloved, but it doesn't turn them into mega stars, but it still elevates them to a level above other rappers at the time. Like there were rap movies, kinda. There were hip hop related movies, but there weren't any like big budget major releases. The Fat Boys, I think, were the first real, yes, the Fat Boys were real. They were the first rap group to have a real movie, but they're also the Fat Boys. So this being such a instant classic and ubiquitous classic was a big deal. It was probably the first true hip hop culture movie. Black youth loved it and still do to this day because again, it acutely told our story and a joyful one at that. Because this also came at a time where so many black movies were these gritty hood dramas about sadness and pain and crime, et cetera, in the hood. And this was like this shining light on the hill. And sadly, it was also the high point of Kid and Play's careers in media and in music, although they would still see more success before the inevitable fall off. It's around here that you do get the strongest argument that they were in fact industry plants. Because although Irby, the love bug, and Hutland and Salt and Pepper helped shepherd them to this point, after this point, they signed with ICM Management, the biggest management company for entertainment at the time, and are represented by a man named Bernie Brillstein, their old white man that we imagine behind any industry plant. And this opens them up to so much more stuff that they probably wouldn't have got without Bernie Brillstein. But it also proves the point that the comps of the being an energy plant isn't all that great because everything they do with this company after a house party is kind of trash. But still, before the quality of their content settles in, they make two more house party movies. The relatively well received House Party 2 in 1992, which is pretty bad upon rewatching. Like at the moment, as a kid, I liked the movie, but it, it did not hold up at all. This is black men using their power of authority against another brother. Hey, you black, this ain't correct. What's up? Example, let's look at this jam on the album that I wrote for. Daddy called me and I like to survive. And House Party 3 was confirmed unwatchable when it came out in 1994. Boy, you're getting mad, man. So tell me about your financiers. She pretty? Oh, my fiance. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You see, my girl and I, we get along fine. Uh-huh. But I'm just having a, a little problem getting her parents to like me. Parents? You want them to get to like you for? Boy, just be yourself. If people don't like you, if you're being yourself, fuck them! They also released my personal favorite movie of theirs, Class Act, which is basically House Party 1.5. It damn near has the exact same story beats and character dynamics of House Party, but they're at least not playing kid and play in the movie. On top of these films, they also had a nine issue comic with Marvel Comics, which was a spinoff from a Saturday morning cartoon, which they also got, which was supposed to materialize into toy and merchandise deals as well. And like people maybe don't understand, there's no bigger, more reliable money than merchandising and toys. Like that would have put them in a world far beyond they could have imagined. But unfortunately it all broke down. Still just having that, four movies, a comic, a TV show, that's unheard of then and now. Today, you're lucky if you get a Sprite commercial, maybe a DLC scan in Fortnite or something, but a multimedia entity as a rapper, that's just not happening. And it wasn't happening until Kid and Play kind of opened those doors. And after Kid and Play and kind of during, you suddenly see rappers, not just A-listers, but like Fragile Star from the Onyx had like multiple roles and sticky fingers. Both these niggas, the, the Onyx niggas was actors. It, anyway, unfortunately for them, it seems like they weren't fully appreciating like what this new level of exposure and marketing was like. They didn't appreciate the business after their cartoon was unceremoniously canceled and their comic and tour line met the same fate. Instead of rolling with these punches and continue to seek out media success, it sounds like they cut off their nose to spite their face and low key quit the industry. Like supposedly they had a sitcom in development with NBC that would have had them co-starring with Don Riggles. And like at this same time, the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air and Living Single are becoming huge hits. I'm shocked that they didn't see the value in making the jump to TV. And this is all while their musical career is clearly showing signs of slowing down or more accurately being overshadowed. And by 1994, after the bomb that was House Party 3, the writing was on the wall for Kid and Play and the moment had passed them by. Aside from the fact that again, that film was unwatchable, a clear step down 
from the second film, which is also bad. It felt like in a short period of time, just four or five years, they went from being cool and cutting edge and hip and entertaining to corny and played out. The kids that liked them as 11, 12 year olds weren't really feeling them as 16 and 17 year olds. Yeah, and then also too, like I said, Kid and Play were transitioning. So, you know, you know, groups like us was looking, we were looking corny. Mm -hmm. You know, we were just like, you know what I mean? We, groups like us and Kwame and even, uh, you know, Will and Jeff, like we were, we were, you know what Eminem used to say, you call a product. And even as they showed efforts to change and keep up, their imagery was so iconic to that previous era that I don't think people allowed them to move from that spot in their minds. Like the weirdest thing to me, even today in 2024, was going from House Party 1 and 2 to House Party 3, where Kid has this Milli Vanilli fade lock thing going on and being like, oh, why are you doing that? Why do y'all look like this? Why do y'all sound like this? This is all wrong. Go back to the first house party. And this is why the aforementioned Hurry to Love Bug saw the writing on the wall and cashed out. He left while they tried to hold on a bit longer, but eventually they had to face their fate because even with their industry backing and success that was unmatched for the time, they were dead, but not just dead. They were murdered. They were shot in the head in broad daylight for everyone to see. And the person that pulled the trigger was gangster rap. So astute viewers familiar with this era of hip hop that I've been talking about have probably noticed that I've been leaving out some major figures that were big in hip hop at the time, namely NWA, The Ghetto Boys, Ice-T, Cool G Rap, and other gangster rap or much more raw and uncut rap acts at the time that were making waves in the late 80s. And although they didn't have nearly as much corporate interest as Kid and Play, gangster rap still had a huge groundswell of support and a huge presence in hip hop culture, just as big as anything Kid and Play were doing. Really, it was kind of like an arms race from the late 80s to the early 90s to dictate what the music and the culture of hip hop should be going forward. This new thing of hip hop that was really only a little over a decade old wasn't quite sure where it was going. Was hip hop supposed to be righteous and political as we saw with Public Enemy and the aforementioned Boogie Down Productions, or should hip hop be gritty as depicted in those early gangster rap figures I just mentioned, or was hip hop just here for a good time like what Kid and Play was doing along with Will Smith? This was a legit question at the time, and by the 90s it was becoming clear that the fun stuff that was unoffensive and highly marketable was not gonna win. And ironically, a big reason for that was how commercially successful and marketable and big it had gotten in a short period of time. See, one of hip hop's most significant figures to this day is its irreverence. Hip hop is counterculture and on some levels revolutionary. And there's nothing revolutionary about anti-drug commercials and Saturday morning cartoons. It's just did not fit with the way people who were of hip hop culture imagined it when they were in the center of it. And for Kid and Play, the center of hip hop was the consumer. And the consumer was white and kind of young. And it didn't help that their actual music wasn't very good. It wasn't even close. In 1992, Kid and Play released their third and last album, Face the Nation, a preachy kind of weird thing that seemed to want to keep up with the growing trend of hip hop being more than party music, but lacked the conviction to get it done effectively. They even made the mistake of dissing the two live crew and Uncle Luke, to which he responded with probably the meanest diss record that I had never heard up until researching for this video, a song called Bitch Ass Kid and Ho Ass Play. Y'all house niggas, I'm a feel nigga, we feel niggas here in Miami. That's why y'all niggas can't understand us. Y'all fuck niggas talking too much shit. Y'all niggas better watch what you're saying because y'all fuck niggas, y'all don't know. But that same year in 1992, like we think of that as early in hip hop, but some classic shit was coming out. We had Gang Stars, Daily Operation, Bookie Down Productions, Sex and Violence, Red Man released What the Album, UGK released Too Hard to Swallow, and most significantly, Dr. Dre released The Chronic. Still to this day, one of the best rap albums 
of all time in an era where new jack swing was still a prominent sound and break beats was still the core of so much of what hip hop was nothing sounded like what dr dre had just created and the rap game in fact the entirety of music the music world stood up and took notice by comparison kid and plays face the nation didn't just seem corny it seemed like a relic in its own time by comparison kid and play simply didn't keep up with other forms of hip hop artistically. It wasn't just the fact that it was gangster rap. It was that gangster rap for all its flaws was art and kit and play really wasn't. And hip hop would only get more artistically ambitious as the decade went on. By 1994, again, the year House Party 3 released, we would get several all time classics. Nas is Illmatic, Biggie's Ready to Die, Scarface is the Diary, and Outkast's Southern Playlistic Cadillac Funky Music. Even the conscious alternative rap that was beginning to fade into the background still had good stuff with Common's Resurrection, Diggable Planet's Blowout Comb, and the rest of development Zynga Almaduni. All of that was happening while Kid and Play was still kind of doing the same thing they were doing in 1988. The 90s is when hip hop went from a musical and cultural aesthetic and movement to a complex art form, and Kid and Play weren't really artists like that, nor were they complex. But this wasn't some industry plant stuff. It wasn't a scandal or anything complex. Kid and Play just fell off. They came up organically. Everything at, until their highest point was all them and other people of the culture. But in the end, real hip hop won regardless. The corporate backing stuff that they had actually is probably what got them killed in the first place. But I don't like saying real hip hop won. Not if you really pay attention to what happened to hip hop at this time. Hindsight tells us that great music from the 90s notwithstanding, I think we got the whole aftermath of this kind of fucked up. And again, this is another reason why I don't buy into the industry plant concept then and now. Today, when people say industry plant, they're insinuating that the art being presented is somehow more manufactured and commodified than the art that comes from less successful or visible artists or artists that are more real and raw and less connected to the industry. And this isn't categorically false, but it presents a false dichotomy that hides the reality of what the music industry is then and now, which is that the entire system at the time and still today is an industry. Specifically at the time where Kid and Play was most active, there were no parts of the industry not controlled by corporate forces. Like if you pointed to say Public Enemy or NWA and said that was real hip hop, that doesn't really make a lot of sense. Yes, they were better from an artistic standpoint, but those acts were still within the industry, still signed to record labels. There were still the same old white man in control of what hip hop was in the public eye. Like we had it in our head that there was a battle for the soul of hip hop in the future and that Kid and Play's youth-friendly sanitized product represented corporate white influence for commercial appeal. And, you know, NWA and Rakim was raw and real hip hop, too raw for the radio and only here for the streets. But no, each genre was just viable in a unique way. And the corporations, the industry, were on both sides of the fence, waiting to see who was gonna win the race and emerge to be the most viable vessel for them to make money. NWA was signed to Ruthless Records, who distribute through Sony. Public Enemy was signed to Def Jam, which is also distributed through Sony. Kid and Play had a few labels connected to them, but the parent company was essentially MGM. Everyone was like that at the time. There was only two or three real major companies at the top of every rap label that you can think of. At the time, there was no Spotify, there was no TikTok. You could be an independent artist, but that meant being broke and selling your music out of your trunk. And I'm not trying to disrespect the art form or the history of hip hop when I say that there was no real hip hop ever. I'm just saying that from the moment Run DMC signed that Adidas deal, it all became the culture industry. They were all industry plants. I don't think that it's a coincidence or should it be in retrospect surprising that the monstrous image of gangster rap with black men imagining themselves as brutes and super predators proved to be more lucrative and efficient as a product to sell and thus dominated all of hip hop for the next decade. These corporations, the industry recognized that the larger, more lucrative white audiences that listen to rap were more interested in gangster fantasies from NWA than the fun time, positive dance music of Kid and Play. And the fact that the culture endorsed it as real didn't hurt either, which is ironic because if you know anything about NWA, they were probably much more fake than Kid and Play. 
Like Kid, yes, was a dork who just wandered into rap, but Play was more street than any of the dudes in NWA. The only person in NWA with any real life street credibility was Easy E, and at most the rest of the members witnessed maybe some gangster stuff, but none of them lived it. And then they had the nerve to make fun of Kid and Play for being corny while they toured together. It was like that. It was one time where a cop caught me right after I, I sold the, the, the shotgun and traded it for three snub nose 38s and two high powered pellet guns. For those who lived in New York at the time, we had a mayor by the name of Mayor Koch who had just passed this law that whoever was, because the gun thing was getting out of hand. So this thing was whoever was found with a gun was gonna get a certain amount of years. And for every bullet found in the gun and on your person, there'd be a year for every bullet. So I just finished doing this transaction, got some money, got traded the shotgun for these uh, 38 snub noses, yada, yada, yada. And I got all this money on me. And like, excuse the term, an asshole, I decided to hop the train style. And yet we followed them as they talked about fake lives of crime and drugs that they didn't even know anything about. And Kit and Play were trying to be drug free and positive. We called them corny. And that shit, that shit is cringe in retrospect. Oh, that is an L for the culture. And don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to get into some respectability politics bullshit. Like, I don't think rap has caused any of the problems that black youth have faced for the last 30 years. The same issues that black people are facing then and now. These things were happening in the 70s too when we were at one of the most violent times in American history and black folks were listening to soul music and R&B the whole time. So I'm not implying gangster rap ruin a generation by itself, but I do think that the image and culture of hip hop that we promoted was definitely not something that was very naturally us, at least not natural in the way we tend to think it. Because why wasn't Kid and Play natural? They were just as organic a thing as anybody else in that rap equation. I think the reason why we look at them as not truly representative of real hip hop or the black culture experience based on what gangster rap and hip hop has tricked us into thinking for the last 30 years. That is the culture industry at work. It's music and art that shapes the way we perceive and reproduce culture. We now look at rappers as leaders and idols, and maybe that's true in a few cases, but it's definitely not true in most cases. And we can't tell the difference because we never learned how to scrutinize our own culture within this industry. This is what Adorno and Horkheimer were trying to point out with their analysis of the culture industry. They recognize that as creative and amazing the art produced might be, it's still a production. It's still the creation that all this art serves the purpose of being bought and sold. Hip hop in its sentiment had a revolutionary potential and a radical implication, but as soon as the radical started taking brand deals, the revolution was over. And of course, Kid and Play fit into that description. It's not like it would have been any different if hip hop would have became more of what they were than anything else. But I do feel like it would have been less likely to, I don't know, capture the radical imagination of an entire industry. It would have just maybe been a cooler, better vibe for the most part. Because the truth is, everyone is industry plans. There's a reason why Kid and Play, Salt and Pep, and Martin Lawrence all became famous from that same crew because they collaborated with each other, because they put each other on as much as they could. And as they became successful, they kept connected to each other and worked with each other across all these areas. The same for NWA, when Cube and Dre splintered off, Cube gets into acting and learns how to make movies. And he learns from John Singleton and F. Gary Gray, and then he makes his own films and guides his own media career. And the next thing you know, he's in a movie with John Witherspoon that we also saw on House Party. The reason why there's so many cool figures and historical black artists and actors and comedians and singers connected to Kid and Play is because it was a small group that had to be connected to each other in order to share resources that they were getting because they had access to that larger Hollywood apparatus because they showed themselves to be valuable to the machine and they were let in the door. And thankfully, some of them kept the door open for others on the way in. But let's be clear, when they went in to the machine, they became a part of it. And we should always remain critical of that, even when they make things we like. We should never get too enthusiastic at the ability of these talented artists to reproduce culture that we think truly, truly reflects the entirety of our being as black people, because it doesn't, or at least it shouldn't, because if it's coming from that large apparatus, then it's not truly coming from blackness. We should always be very critical when we're inclined to see one form of art as real and another as fake because it's all fake, all of it.
especially Drake. And then thinking about this, it makes me kind of sad that we didn't give Kid and Play their flowers at the time, that we allowed them to kind of be this scapegoat to be the wrong type of hip hop for the era when I think hip hop might be better off with a little more fun, a little less seriousness. I think some of that soul rock and roll R&B aesthetic and dudes wanting to perform and dance and be in costumes and be passionate about their art form and their talent is truly missing from hip hop right now. I think this is why you hear about people not wanting to go to rap shows because the modern rap superstars right now, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them don't really love the art of it. They're only there for the culture industry commodity part. And that sucks. And I'm not saying Kid and Play would have fixed that, but I think in an alternate reality where Kid and Play and Will Smith and Chubb Rock and Kwame Special Ed and Dougie Fresh and all these more fun party-based rappers are allowed to continue to be a big part of the culture going forward, I think that's a much better universe to live in. And yes, I do think in that universe, Jada Pinkett gets to marry Tupac. Play! What's happening, baby? Kid and Play, despite being pushed aside by gangster rap, managed to stay relatively relevant. Like I said, they're a part of this constant touring circuit for old school rappers. So folks like Salt and Pepper, Dougie Fresh, they're always coming to a city near you. If you're in a major city, there's always an old school concert on the way. And they're usually a part of one or two of them. And Kid had a relatively significant acting career, managing to stay busy, popping up on sitcoms as a guest appearance all through the 90s and 2000s. Play went into ministry and became a born again Christian while also still working in media behind the scenes. And they always seem to pop up for a podcast appearance or two, though I can't vouch for some of the company that they keep sometimes, but that's, you know, that's that's another conversation. And while a few good hits, two pretty good movies and a lot of memories is a lot less than some of the other legends from this era, that's still a really amazing legacy for the hottest rap act of the late 80s and early 90s. And if you look at the record, almost all of that came before the industry plant label would be appropriate. The rest was the true essence of hip hop. Just young black people trying to make it. And while the reality is that hip hop was captured then and still is now, and is just as corporate and commodified in its state then as it is now, it doesn't mean that it's not valuable and good. We just have to improve our analysis of it. If you don't take away anything from this video, take away the fact that the goal is to not look at hip hop passively, to be critical of it. And maybe in the future with the decentralized nature of music these days, and some real good conversations and coordination from the culture, maybe we can reach the potential hip hop had way back in the 80s before it got corporatized and commodified. I think it's still possible. Speaking of both reaching full potential, but also being corporately sponsored, let's talk about today's sponsor, Nebula. Talking about hip hop is one of my favorite things to do on this channel and my side channel, Signified B-Sides. However, Music criticism and commentary is definitely not easy to do on YouTube because of YouTube's strict and to be frank, nonsensical copyright rules. I can make an hour long video that I put months of work into. And if I use five seconds of a copyrighted song, the copyright holders of that song can claim every cent I make off that entire video. And my ability to fight against this claim depends on the benevolence of the copyright holder and not the actual interpretation of the legal rules of free use and copyright right laws. I say all this to say, it's sometimes tough making certain types of content on YouTube. This is why on many of my hip hop videos, I use uncopyrighted music in live performances and it works, but it's not the same. This is just one example of why I'm so happy that I'm a member of Nebula and why you should become a member too. Nebula is the internet's premier independent streaming service where creators such as myself can make the type of content we want to make without many of the limitations that we often find here on YouTube. So this means if you watch a lot of my older hip hop videos, instead of hearing distorted, muffled, or live versions of songs, you'll hear the real music. You'll also not have to worry about commercials breaking up the flow of the video or ad reads at the end of the video like this one you're watching now. But more than that, you're also going to get content that can't be seen anywhere else on YouTube. Not just from me, but from many of YouTube's most talented creators. There's a mix of science, history, music, politics, and more, and none of which that can be seen anywhere else. But it's also more than just elevated YouTube videos. We also have independent films in the way, stage plays, and documentaries in development. 
And that's the biggest thing, to be honest. This movement we're on at Nebula is only possible with your direct support. Nebula does not have any big corporate backers. We are not a giant tech company. It was started by a bunch of YouTubers and remains as such. But it can only continue that with your direct support, which is why we're offering this product to you through my promo code FD Signifier, which you can find in the link in the description. And by clicking that link, you can get a year subscription to Nebula for 40% off. And if you want to make a bigger investment, you can even get a lifetime membership for $300 and never worry about your membership expiring. Thank you so much for supporting the channel. Thank you so much for watching this far. Thank you to Nebula for sponsoring the video and peace.